Be advised, the following episode contains content that may not be appropriate for all audiences. This is Diary of a Nation. I'm your host, Christina Zlotnick. My podcast explores the human experience in an effort to help us better understand one another. In the third and final part of my interview with Kati Preston, she discusses her associations with Israeli government officials and fellow Holocaust survivors, plus her current interests and her take on American politics. You've come across some famous people yes, over your I life, have. too. Poet Allen Ginsberg. Oh, yeah. He ate, my, he ate my salami. Tell me some stories. Well, I, we were having a party in Israel. We used to have these wonderful parties. And somebody brought a man called Allen Ginsberg. They said he's very famous in America. This very hairy guy sat in my kitchen. And I had a Hungarian salami, which was a big deal because we were all pretty hungry in Israel in those days. And I went and sliced up this salami, making it ready to bring it in to share with my friends. And I went out to get it and he'd eaten most of it. And I remember screaming at him, how dare you eat my salami? I'm the only person I know whose salami was eaten by Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> I said, I don't care who you are. You don't eat everybody's salami. <laughs> Just common decency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How can you do this to us? You know. Oh, and I forgot to talk about my French fiancé. Not French, Danish. <laughs> I, when I was in school... We need a spreadsheet. Yeah. Do you have when, a black book? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll give you the book. In Jaffa, in the school... There was a boy there. A That's Dan Israel. Yeah, there was a Danish boy because all the diplomats' children were in this school because it was English speaking. And it was a, a, a 16 year old tall blonde boy, looked just like the Ivan, the, the, the captain, the Russian captain. And I, I was about 13, and I had a total, total crush on this boy. He was, you know, how, how a kid is, the first love. You can't talk when you see him. It was, it was unbelievable. I was madly in love with him. And he wouldn't look at me because he was after this girl that had tits, and I didn't. I was flat as a board. Well, you do now. Well, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything came a bit later. <laughs> but anyway, this boy eventually took me to the movies. And then when I went to Paris, he came to visit me in Paris and he asked me to marry him, and we went home to his to his parents in, in Copenhagen to get engaged. And I remember this beautiful engagement party. There was such a nice family, and his father was friends with the king, and they were definitely not anti-Semitic. The Danes were very, very liberal. And it was a very strange thing because, again, it was one of these situations that out of pure respect or something, he wouldn't touch me. And I somehow felt that there was something lacking here. So I went back to Paris and found my French boyfriend. I, <laughs> I wasn't engaged to him. I was invited to his parents. And unfortunately, I got pregnant. And he wanted to marry me. And I remember being invited to his parents' house with my stepfather who came over to Paris to sort this out. And we had this very dark dinner. We had Coco Vin, and it was a dark dining room, dark wallpaper, dark conversation. And his brother called me a Jew because he says only a Jew would get my brother ensnared like this. And so... I went back to Israel and had a, an abortion. I didn't have that child. I was brokenhearted. I wanted that child, but it wasn't to be because there was no point. Was it easy to get an abortion in Israel? Oh, yes, yes. It was, it, it was always easy to get an abortion until, until this new fashion that you don't have an abortion anymore. I also remember in those days there was no birth control. You know, it was very haphazard and people would get pregnant. Did it give you pause because of what happened in the Holocaust, though? Because of all the Jewish family I members you lost? Yes, I had a hard time. And this is why, why I was so keen to have children when I got married to Yoram. 
I was very keen and I was worried that I would never have children because I killed that one. But I wanted Jewish children. You know? And it, and that child would have been a French child. How much of a factor was that in having the abortion? I think I think partly that that made it easier for me to some extent. Also I felt betrayed by the father that he didn't he didn't stand up for me. Why why did he let me go? He helped make the baby too. That's right, but he let me go because it's always the girl who carries the brunt. I was the one. I was the one that ensnared him. It, you know, like you do it on your own. No. <laughs> but that's how it was viewed. Yeah. I, I was a bad girl. He was a poor boy. Yeah, it's our fault. Yeah, it's our fault. For having it's sex. Like for, for getting pregnant. Having sex and getting pregnant, yeah. And so when I, when I first uh, got married, I immediately wanted a baby because I wanted to make sure. And when I had my second baby that I couldn't afford, there was no way I was going to have an abortion because I couldn't, you know, all the people who were killed, I couldn't kill a child. What do you think about abortion today, abortion rights? Abortion rights, people shouldn't be made to have a baby if they don't want one. It's bad for you, it's bad for the baby, and and you don't bring unwanted people into the world. I have I have so many friends who 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 have acquaintances who who have what I call throwaway children. You know, my accountant is a foster parent. She has 5 of them. The horror stories of these children who were not aborted because the parents couldn't have an abortion and they were forced to have these babies that they don't want. What kind of life is it for anybody? Why don't we trust women? We should trust people. If you, It's your body. And frankly, you know, when you have a... I, I don't believe in late abortions, but when you have an abortion, when that baby is just a little... It's not really a person yet. It's not. It depends on your religion. Not every religious leader believes that life begins at conception. So how are we, as a democracy in the U.S., deciding who? Yeah. Yes, we're not a theocracy. No, no. But if we were a theocracy, then then we would have to go by with that religion. I think a child becomes a child when it's viable outside the womb. But, and that's what the Supreme Court has recognized. Yes. And that's essence, what they're trying to overturn. What do you think's at play here? Why? Uh, I think there's two reasons. First of all, the religious right has risen its ugly head. And secondly, uh, the companies need what I call fodder, people to work for them. They don't want people to stop having children because then they won't have a workforce. But we're not going to stop having children. In fact, we're going to be more able to support ourselves. But when we they, have children, when they we want, want to. They want people to have children so that they have a workforce, so they have an army. Who else is going to populate all these unwanted situations? Isn't there some measure of control at play, too, on the I part so. of the patriarchy? I think so. The let's part put of the women, religion? Let's put women back in their place. They, they, you know, they hate powerful women or successful women or intelligent women. Why? It, because it, it, it endangers them. Because when you go back in history, way back, way back, before Judeo-Christian religions, there was no such thing as a patriarchy. There were goddesses as well as gods. We had equality. And then it got eroded by the Judeo-Christian religion. It became a patriarchy. And they want to return to that. They, they like that. Men are more comfortable ruling us. And, and I think it scared them originally because we were able to bear children and they didn't quite understand where that power came from. So they had to squash that power because we had the power to procreate. And they had to, they had to put their hand on that. I'm just tired of the shame and I'm tired of our government not trusting us as fully as, formed women to as determine our destiny. Mm -hmm. I think it's all about control. It's control, yes, but the control comes from those reasons, you know. Control is not, not a, a monolithic thing on its own. Control is controlled by other stuff, you know. 
and unfortunately, this, this liberation of women is relatively new. When you think of your mother's generation and our generation, the difference, and your children's generation, it's, it's just a, a blink of an eye in history, in terms of history, over thousands of years of, of subjugation. And we have to fight for it, because if women don't fight, we'll be back in the kitchen. I don't mind the kitchen, but not just the kitchen. <laughs> well, states are doing their level best, states that are controlled by Republicans, for example, mm -hmm. in crafting legislation to chip away at abortion rights. Absolutely. And that's how they're going at it today in this country. They are, and but they won't be able to, because I think... Even if we were to, God forbid, lose the election, the next generation will rise. There will be a revolution. This new generation is not going to take it. The kids today are not going to take it. They believe in equality. They don't care if you're blue, green, yellow, red. They don't care if you're gay, straight. They don't care. And these kids don't talk about wanting to be rich and famous. These kids talk about the environment. You know, they're different. Different animals. I think we've raised good kids. And let's hope that they don't, they don't lose the world before they get it. So you have four sons yes. and four granddaughters. What do you say or what did you say as they were born about Hitler? I remember keep, I kept thinking, you know, that song, To Life, To Life, L'chaim? That played in my head every time I gave birth to a child. And I gave the finger to Hitler. Every time I said to myself, well, Hitler, another Jew and you're dead. It was Fuck wonderful. you, Hitler. Yeah, that's right. And you know, one of the most wonderful historical things that happened to me is when Eichmann was taken to Israel and, and put on trial. I'll never forget that moment. I was holding, I think he was one, my eldest. I was holding him and there was no television then. And I remember turning on the radio and it's the state of Israel uh, against Adolf Eichmann uh, com convicting him of crimes against humanity. And I remember the tears just pouring down my face. What a historical thing this is. The man who killed my father is now in Israel standing trial while I'm standing here with my child. It was unbelievable that I've lived such huge, monumental historical moments. It was earth shattering for me. Are there other famous people or notable events in your life? Well, I, I met Moshe Dayan. He made an eye at me at a party. <laughs> he only had one eye. Former defense minister of Israel. Uh, I met him. I met all the very famous Israeli people. And Tommy, uh, my, my then boyfriend, became deputy prime minister. And I, I went to visit him in Washington. He came to Washington. He was speaking in Washington. And we spent an evening together. It was wonderful because he was... Uh, he, ha he had his bodyguards, and we decided to go to a Chinese restaurant. So we sat at one table, and the three bodyguards sat around us at different tables. And we had our meal, and then, uh, oh, and before that, we had lunch with um, Tom Lantosh. The U.S. congressman from California, the only Holocaust survivor to have served in Congress. His daughter, Katrina Sweat, herself was a congressional candidate here in New Hampshire. He, he was in Budapest with Tommy, uh, also in one of the, the, the Wallenberg houses. He survived that. Explain the significance of the Wallenberg the houses. The Wallenberg house was an amazing thing. It was a diplomat, a Swedish diplomat, very rich from home, who hated what the Nazis were doing. So he went and bought up several houses in Budapest. He put his legation uh, emblem on the outside, making it a Swedish territory, and he let Jews hide there, and he gave them false passports. Another mensch. He saved, uh, oh, 1,500 people. And everybody I knew who had been in Hungary survived through him other than uh, Strasser, who was in that, uh, in, that, in that person's house pretending to be a gay person, everybody else I knew from Budapest survived through there. 
And, you know, Tommy's life was amazing, too, because uh, he and his mother were in this house and people were dying and starving because the war went on. He couldn't get food to all these people. And every day some people died and all the dead were taken up to the attic to keep them cold so they wouldn't smell. And they were all hiding in the basement and there were air raids. And it was his bar mitzvah and his mother decided to use her last bottle of perfume because she didn't want him to have his bar mitzvah in a smelly basement and she spread this Chanel 5 all over the basement. And he had his bar mitzvah there. And then they somehow broke into the house and started herding them towards the Danube. And they were herding all the Jews towards the Danube to shoot them, the, the, the Hungarian Nazis. And the mother said to him, you have to pee and dragged him into one of these outdoor pee places. And he says, I don't have, yes, you have to pee, and pushed him in there, and they got forgotten there. And then the air raids happened again, and there were bombs, and they escaped this way because she made him pee. All the others were shot. They would take them to the side of the Danube and shoot them. I visited Dachau, Germany, you when did? I was on a trip, and... My takeaway is it's completely devoid of color, and it was just so haunting to walk through there. You know, I walked through the Warsaw Ghetto, which they restored beautifully. It looks like Marie Antoinette's farm. You know, it's very pretty, pretty. But I was walking on those cobblestones, and it was like walking on the dead, walking on ghosts. And the most disgusting thing I found, they had a, a, a gift shop, and they had little little carvings, little wooden carvings of religious Jews. They were selling these. I mean, you kill them, and then you make little statues of them. Well, mind you, we're no better doing what, what we're doing with the Indians. We have, we, in all the cigar shops, you have Indians. You know, we celebrate what we kill. Terrible. It's terrible. And this is what these children have to learn. And this is why I'm so keen on doing this program. You know, I've been asked to go and work with the Cohen Center in Keene State uh, to, to craft a curriculum. The Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College here in New Hampshire. To craft a curriculum for the schools, and I want every single genocide taught. Not just possible, yours. Not just mine, because I don't want people to think, well, I'm not a Jew, so I'll be safe. No, you're not safe. Anybody can get killed. And if we don't fight prejudice, it can lead to genocide. And I want children to know what we've done to other people so that they don't do it. And I'm sure that if it's taught correctly, they can teach it one hour a day or one, 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 one year. I don't care. Just touch on it. Touch on it. And I will make sure that on every genocide there's a speaker as well because you have to personalize it because, you know, big numbers are statistics. The reason that my story resonates when I go to a school is because it, I talk about a little girl. They identify that one child who had to leave everything behind and whose family were killed and who almost died because of prejudice. You said the red coat, the girl in the red coat in mm -hmm. Schindler's List mm -hmm. reminds you of yes. yourself. I, yeah, mine was a blue coat, but I remember going to see that movie and seeing the little girl in the red coat, and I had to run out. I, 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 I couldn't take it. I was, I, was, I was having an anxiety attack, and I went into the ladies' room, and I was sobbing. And the woman said, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm the little girl in the red coat. She looked at me funny and thought I was insane and left me there. I was the little girl in the red coat. It was scary. But again, Schindler's List also was so clean. The concentration camp was so clean. You know, everything was, was, was real, but somehow it was, it, was too, it was too orderly. Sterilized? Yeah, it was sterilized. There was no, there was no junk. There was no, there was no squalor. There, whereas in the concentration camp, there was squalor. It was, it was dirty. It was, it was sick. It was vomit and, and shit everywhere. I mean, it wasn't beautiful and, and, and well-kept. 
although they made them clean it. But, you know, when somebody's dying, they don't do a very good job cleaning. I remember reading something about concentration camp victims sitting on a long bench and relieving themselves. Mm -hmm. But they were so close together that they would relieve themselves on someone else. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was, it was terrible. It was terrible. You lose, you lose every kind of dignity as a human. And that was the purpose. They wanted you to lose your dignity. That's why they cut your hair and put numbers on you and treated you as a number because the, you have to lose your dignity. Because they had to suppress their own humanity to treat you as, as worse than human. an animal. That's right. Because if I have the same problem, I can't eat meat at the moment because of what they do to animals in farms. I, I would eat meat if it was a normal farm animal, you know, who had a, that we can't disrespect everything that's alive. And a lot of kids now are vegetarian because of these factory farms. There are a lot of good kosher farming practices yes. though yes and also even the even the halal butchers yes. are better and i have no problem i mean i have chickens in the backyard i have eggs a couple of chickens uh were um past having eggs so somebody slaughtered them for me and i processed them and made soup it's okay they had a decent life they roam outside they go they do what they like and even the dogs don't bother them. <laughs> I go out in the barn and I run into a chicken. You know, it happens. <laughs> so Schindler's List did a pretty good job in your eyes. Yes. But what movies did not do a good job relating I the Holocaust? Found, I found the boy in the striped pajama was very unrealistic. How so? There's no way the little boy could have escaped across the fence. There's no it it would it wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have had the interaction of the of the two children, of the Nazi child and the other child. There was no way they would be allowed to be anywhere near the the so called dirty Jews. We were considered vermin. Would you let your child play with a rat? No. It was unrealistic. I thought it was too it was too romantic in some ways. I felt The Pianist was a very good one, was a very good film, very realistic. Most of them are not bad. Most of them are not bad. We've told a lot of Holocaust stories, but I appreciate how you are so willing to include every genocide it's important in your for discussions. Me. As a human, I have to care about other humans. You can't just be a Jewish human. You have to be a human human. So I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we had white supremacists among us. Oh, my God. One of them, Dennis Mahon, he's now in federal prison. He worked as an aircraft mechanic in Tulsa, and he once served as the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He was also the Oklahoma coordinator of the White Aryan Resistance, wow. and he ran twice for mayor of Tulsa. He also once led 60 people in a cross burning near Berlin. And a new draft report from the Department of Homeland Security says white supremacists are the greatest terrorist threat, threat here in the U.S. I know. What should our government be doing? It should be outlawed. Look, Germany managed. And I have a lot of respect for Germany for doing what they're doing. You know, I have no problem going to Germany now. But I have a problem going south because I, I can't go somewhere where my half-black granddaughter wouldn't be welcome. I have one who's half African-American, one who's half Mexican. I have one step-granddaughter who's ha half Chinese. And I have one who's half German. And when my son married the German girl, he came to see me and he says, I'm getting married to this wonderful Canadian actress. And I said, wonderful, I'm very happy. And he says, well, there's a slight problem. I said, what problem can there be? She sounds great. No, he says, uh, her father was in the German army. So I swallowed and I swallowed and I swallowed again. And I thought, well, no, we don't visit the sins of the father on the children. And besides that, her father was 16 when he was in the army. 
and I don't think he killed any Jews. And when he was on his deathbed, he called me. And I didn't meet him, but he called me up and he said, I owe you an apology. I said, what for? He says, what my people did to your people. He says, I don't think I killed a Jew, but I don't like what my people did to your people. And I want to tell you that I love your son like my own. I was really, I was, I was so gratified by this. And they have a daughter, my son and, 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 and my daughter-in-law have a little girl. And when she was about 11, she came home from school and she says, she loved her grandpa. And she says, why didn't you tell me grandpa was in the wrong war? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a child that I want to go to Auschwitz with because she needs exorcism too. Are you planning to go soon? When they open well, up. Yeah. Soon, who knows where we're going to be. But maybe next year? Maybe next year. I'd like to before I die. I have to hurry up. I'm 81. You know, how much longer am I going to have a reprieve from death? That'll be interesting. I you hope know you're who, around for you know, decades. Thank you. You know who my cultural hero is at the moment? Uh, Ferenc. Uh, ben Ferenc, the Harvard-trained lawyer the last living Nuremberg prosecutor. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Annie was eventually transferred to a unit in General Patton's army that investigated war crimes. He's still alive. He's a hundred. And he's as bright as a penny. He was in, very young when he was a prosecutor there. And he's a great humanitarian. He speaks against what is happening today. And he says that our president is committing uh, crimes against humanity by, by allowing the white supremacists. He, th he, he talks against that. And that man is an amazing man because I quote him sometimes in my lectures. I talk about him because he was an immigrant. His, pa his father was a tailor, simple family. He was born in the same bed as his sister. He was born in Hungary and she was born in Romania. Again, you know that place, changing places. And he came to the States and when he was a child, he and his sister would sit at the dinner table and the father would say to them every night, what have you done for humanity today? The least thing they can do, you know, help somebody cross the road, carry somebody's parcel, be kind to a dog. Every person can do something good every day. And I keep telling kids that if you just do one good thing a day, go sit to the, next to the kid who doesn't have anyone else sitting with him. Say something nice to somebody who's persecuted. Stand up for people. Don't be a bystander. You have to stand up. You are your brother's keeper. And until we are our brother's keeper, we don't have a decent society. You also say that 80% of people are sheep. Talk yes. about the other 20%. Well, 10%, I think, are truly good people. And 10% are truly evil. And 80% are sheep. And the sheep are the dangerous ones because they will follow the bully. It's much easier to follow someone who's bad because you don't have to do anything. You just have to stand there and giggle. Whereas if you follow the good people, you might have to do something. You might have to do some action. And that takes effort. And a lot of people are lazy. And therefore, they just follow the bully. And that scares me. That really scares me. And what I'd like you to do on election night, will you call me one way or another? Because I'm going to be sitting here with my boys with bottles of champagne and ropes. Bottles of champagne if we win and ropes, we hang ourselves if we don't. <laughs> so call me, will you? You, you, can, will, you, you can edit this You're making out. me tear up. Yeah, me too. But I can't cry. I, can, <laughs> I tear up, but I don't cry. <laughs> I, I can't cry. This is awful. Maybe it will come to me. Maybe something will trigger it. But, I, you know, I perhaps it's because I nursed my husband for more than a year and I saw this big, strong man reduced to nothing. And I nursed him here. I didn't let him go to a nursing home. And he was bedridden and he was... He was ashamed, you know, he was ashamed. And he kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm a burden. I said, you're not a burden. And, you know, I mourned for a year. And maybe I have no tears left because of that. Well, even though you may not have any more tears, you have your humanity. And not everyone can say that about themselves, if they're honest. 
I try. I don't think I'm good enough. I try. But I'm getting better. As you get older, you become kinder, I find. And this is why I'm so surprised at these kids. They're far more advanced than, than I was 30 years ago. Their humanity is, is, is amazing. Maybe it's the internet, you know. They might be more open. I know it has a lot of bad things, the internet, but it also has a lot of good. It has a lot of good. Like my little African-American granddaughter, she was at a school in Manchester, at the high school, and they had a day off, and they found out that that horrible organization that goes to uh, gay funerals to demonstrate, it's a church, they were going to come and demonstrate outside her school because they had a gay-straight alliance. Those protesters were members of the infamous Westboro Baptist Church from Kansas. And she got on her computer and all the kids went and stood around these people singing hymns and spirituals and completely drowned them out. And the police came and the police joined the kids. <laughs> I was very proud of her. As you should be. Hmm. How do we reach the other side, though? Because that's how we make progress. One of the schools I spoke at way up north, very white area, I got a letter from a kid saying, Dear Mrs. Preston, until I heard your speech, I really didn't think much about gays or Jews, but I will make a point of meeting some now. That's, that's how you do it, by speaking, by reaching out, and by teaching them about genocide. So Germany obviously has strict laws banning Nazi symbols yeah. and associated forms of hate speech. Yeah. Holocaust denial is a crime I know. there. There are zero public statues of Hitler in Berlin. Here in the U.S., Confederate statues and flags are in public display, yes. mainly across the South. Military bases are named after Confederate generals. Yes. What do you make of that difference? It has to change. I make a, a, a basically remember that there was a big big push to retain slavery. People like having slaves. That's the problem. It's all to do with money. Big corporations aren't against slavery. They would be very happy to have slaves. It just has to change from, from the grassroots up. Regular, everyday people. Everyday people. And I think, you know, the average American is still a decent person. You can reach them somehow. You can reach them. If they, but at the moment, they're brainwashed by this... This, this, this myth of this rich, wonderful man who's going to save them. See, America has never been invaded. Americans are so sheltered, they don't understand some of these things. They don't know what it means that somebody comes into your house and throws you out. They, they don't understand. They can't conceive this. And this is why history, history, and education, 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 education. Because, you know, people who, who were part of liberating Europe... They've seen it. They were not like this. They did not fly Nazi flags when they came home. Think about it. All the World War II heroes, they were horrified. They didn't want this to happen. In Hungary today, far-right Prime Minister Viktor Orban know, horrible. seems intent on creating an authoritarian government. What do you see going on there? Well, I remember, you know, when, when my son started making this little film, I wanted to find the costumes for the soldiers that were hunting me. And my husband researched it, and he came with a picture of these, these soldiers with the black feathers. And, and I said, oh, great, where did you find this? What history book? He says, it's not a history book. It's Hungary today. That's what it is. It's very scary. It's very scary. Unfortunately, the Hungarians were probably worse than the Poles in, in exterminating their own Jews. And I, I don't know whether it's to do with the Catholic religion where we're blamed for Jesus, but the Catholic countries were more anti-Semitic than the Protestant ones for some reason. It seems. Because, for instance, Romania, it wasn't as bad. They were Greek Orthodox. And the, and the Pope, I mean, come on, that Pope was Hitler's Pope, you know. I was in I was in in um, Italy with my my two granddaughters, and we were in the basement of the basilica where all the popes are laid out, you know, in stone. 
And I kept saying, where's Pope? Where's Hitler's Pope? Why, why do you want to see him, Grandma? I said, I want to spit on his grave. They dragged me out of there. They, you can't do that, Grandma. You <laughs> it was so cute. You can't spit on Yes, I can, you know. <laughs> How do you think all those people escaped to Argentina? Again, a Catholic country. Through the rat line of, of, of all these people who were helping each other uh, through through the church. And because the church had a different agenda, they were against communism because the communists didn't believe in, in God and church. They allied themselves with the Nazis to exterminate communists and Jews. In a very broad sense, do you think religion and religious institutions have done more good for humanity or I think more they've harm? done harm. I think they've done harm. More harm than good? More harm than good. Just think. Of, just think of all the religious persecutions. Just think it's what the Ottoman Turks did. I mean, every religion kills. Here in the U.S., two thirds of American Jews reliably vote for Democrats, and this has been the case for decades. Why do you think that is? Maybe because of 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 having learned history. Maybe maybe they feel that perhaps the Democrats are more humanitarian, because ultimately a Jew should be a humanitarian. They they are taught to do good, and because we don't go to heaven or hell when we die, we can only atone for our sins. We don't get a pass like the Catholics do, so we have to be a bit better. Social justice. Mm, that's right. And maybe separation of church and state, too. Yes, that, too. That, too. And also, they tend to be more educated. And the more educated you are, the more you question the dogma of religion. What you've been fed. That's right. You, you question. And, you know, when I speak in schools, I always tell children, you know, you don't have to listen to your teachers. You don't have to listen to your parents. They look at me funny. I said, you have to listen to your heart. Because each of you have a heart. And if you rely on your own heart and your own kindness, you'll be okay. doesn't matter what anybody tells you. So President Trump issued an executive order last year, and it targeted anti-Semitism, and it expanded the definition of anti-Semitism. It was a response to anti-Jewish bias at U.S. colleges and universities. It's a troubling development the rise in anti-Semitism across campuses, the anti-Zionism activism, and the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. What are your thoughts on what's going on in higher education? I am very worried about it. I've seen it happen in Britain. I have nieces in Britain in higher education, and it's almost a cookie-cutter thing, condemning Israel, to some extent, I understand why. I don't approve of everything Israel does at the moment. Absolutely not. I hate the prime minister who's in Israel now. This is not my Israel that I remember. It wasn't like that before. And I'm afraid that it's very easy to go from disapproving of Israel to disapproving of Jews because it it kind of lumps us all together and let's let's separate the two because you can be anti political thing but pro jew but you cannot be anti jewish and anti israeli in the same thing and this is a danger that it's very easy to slip into it anti zionism is anti semitism absolutely because you know <laughs> let's put it this way there's no anti-Zionism without anti-Semitism because the Zionists are Jews. But there is anti-Semitism without anti-Zionism on its own. But it's much easier to just lump it all together, you know. And unfortunately, you know, you find that academia, again, is a little bit like sheep. They get a sort of leadership from the top and it takes a good academic to stand up to it. And they're afraid of losing their tenure or something. You know, again, that too has something to do with it. And also there's less money in academia. They're paid less. So the, the higher up the college is, the less prejudiced they are because they can afford not to be prejudiced. 
Kati, you're 81 years old, and you don't seem to be afraid of death at all. No, I'm not. I have made peace with death a long time ago. I was surrounded by death through my childhood, and then I had terminal cancer 15 years ago, and they gave me six months. And for some unknown reason, I recovered. And since then, you know, I know that there is a thing called death, and it's sort of waiting for me, but... I kind of ignore it. I don't really worry about it. Nothing. It doesn't scare me. And sometimes people say to me, well, you're speaking in public. What happens if somebody tries to kill you? And I said, well, the only thing they can do is kill me, but they can't take my life away because I've lived already. That's a big triumph. You know how many people in my past would have given anything to live one year, two years? But all this long time, and you know, somehow I feel that I'm here on borrowed time anyway, because why am I given this long life when all those wonderful people were take you know they were they they were de- they were killed, and they had no lives they they had nothing they you know all the, my family you know for instance twenty eight members of my family who used to come to dinner and we used to have these huge family dinners and, you know, aunts and uncles. I mean, my father, they were nine children. They were nine brothers and sisters and they all had families and children. So you can imagine the sort of dinner parties we could have. And all those people, they were valuable, decent human beings. Their children were all college educated, which in those days was a big deal because, as you know, The one thing that Jews respected more than anything is education. And that was one of the problems that they had. Because they were educated, they got into better positions. And the better the positions became, the more more envy and the more hatred. And everybody thought that they were trying to take over. Even now, you know, they talk about the Jewish conspiracy. And when I speak in schools, I always say to the kids, well, if you find out where it is, get me the address. I'd like to join. (laughs) There is no such thing as Jewish conspiracy. I mean, this is ridiculous. How about Jewish hard work? Uh, Yeah, Jewish hard work. Well, yeah, education, education, education. And, you know, I do believe that education is the only solution to our world today. Because when, when you don't know, when you're not educated and you don't know something, it, it frightens you. And if you're frightened of something, then you hate it. And if you hate it, you want to kill it. And that produces terrible strife. But, you know, it pains me to think of how many possibilities were extinguished during the Holocaust. Not just Jews, but how many brilliant people, how many, how many teachers, philosophers, artists, painters, great brains, uh, scientists... How many wonderful talents have been extinguished? Because when you take a number like six million, there must have been many, many, many very, very valuable human beings. And when you extinguish that amount of people, it does make a difference. It leaves it leaves a, a hole. I mean, my father was not a complicated man. He was not a particularly intelligent man. He was a very nice man. He had a wholesale fish business, and he would he would have these great big crates in the river with live carp, and he was wholesaling them. And this this business was was very beneficial because he also fed all the hungry in town, because whenever he finished selling, whatever fish was left, he would give away for free. And these were normal things that people did, and they were not thought thought of as extraordinary. People were all trying to to help each other. And, you know, for instance, one of the people they killed was my my pediatrician, Dr. Balint, who saved my life when I was a little girl because I had an ear infection and he had to cut part of my skull out, which was very unusual for those days to have such a complicated operation. That man was killed too. And then the 52 children who were in my kindergarten, in my Jewish kindergarten, one of them survived. But uh, one of the children, there was a little boy that I used to play with all the time. His name was Ishvan Cohen. His parents were 
very well off and they lived down the road from us in a big, beautiful house. And I remember envying him so much because they made a, a bust of him and it was on their mantelpiece. It was like a marble thing. And I thought this was absolutely beautiful. It was like a museum piece. And Ishtvanka and I used to chase each other in front of the opera house. And the game was that if I caught him, I kissed him. And I used to run very fast because I really liked him and I kissed him a lot. At age and he, four. And he, yes, and he hated it. <laughs> I remember him wiping his little face. He was so cute. He had big blue eyes and curly blonde hair. He looked more like a girl than a boy. He was adorable. And unfortunately, he too was killed. And his father, who was a doctor, was killed. And his beautiful, elegant young mother. And all the other people who I knew. I mean, there's... Really, nobody left from my childhood, no Jewish people left from my childhood, except for one person whom I met much later. The lady, the doctor. I, yeah, I met a lady, I, I met her in London. And of course, then, you know, I'm very grateful to the woman who saved me. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you know, every year uh, when they have the Kristallnacht celebration in Keene, it's usually in a big movie house, a big theater. And there's usually over 800 people there. And every year I go and I light a candle for her and I thank her. She's my hero. I mean, a simple Christian peasant girl who just did the right thing. And unfortunately, not many people did that. Getting back to your family members, we talked about your father at some length in earlier interviews. Yes. Your mother, are there other things you'd like to say about her life? I mean, she obviously lived a long life. My mother lived a longish, longish life, yes. Well, long life, yes. My mother, you know, she was never the same after the war. She used to be a very, a very happy sort of person, laughed a lot. She was very jokey. Her whole life, she was very diffident and 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 suspicious of people that she didn't know. If somebody knocked on the door, she would say, what do they want? Why, why are they coming here? She was frightened. She was frightened. And that's it what the Holocaust her. took away from her. So much was taken from her. Her husband, whom she loved, they tried to kill her child, they tortured her, and then they took everything from her, from us, you know, there was nothing left. And then she reestablished her business and she started making a, a life again, and then the communists came and took everything away. So she had every good reason to doubt people. Other people in your family, can you talk about them? I remember cousins, I remember one cousin, Gustav, I remember a little cousin, Eva, but I was the youngest one. They were all older than me, and they were all, they all spoiled me rotten. And they were very proud of me because I could speak German. So when they came to dinner, I would perform for them. They'd say, say this in German and say that in German. And I would stand there and recite things in German. And people would pat me on the head and call me a genius. And I believed it. Mm -hmm. When we lost all of your family members, what did humanity lose? What were your family members like? What would they have become, for they, example? What were their interests? They're in, well, the, the younger ones all, want, all wanted to be doctors and lawyers. I don't know. That was the thing. You know, all Jews wanted to be doctors and lawyers. And also there was a lot of, a lot of intellectual um, acumen, you know. People have lost a lot of thinkers because that in itself was very valuable. I mean, just think of how much Jews have contributed to the world, even after the Holocaust. So once you got to New Hampshire, you began the Hampstead Stage Players Company. We, we did that. Uh, yes, basically, I inherited that from one of my sons who, who, were, who was at the time an actor and writer. And he started a small theater company. And then he decamped to California and then to Canada, and I was left holding the baby, literally. And I worked at it for 30 years. We ended up doing over a 1,000 shows a year, two-man shows. We went to schools, and I think it's very important. Uh, you know, one way of, of getting children to, to listen is through drama. And when they look at a, at a performance, 
it rivets them and they learn from it. And for instance, we did adaptations of Shakespeare and Greek mythology, all the classics and also original plays. But one of the things we did, when we did Romeo and Juliet, we had one of the actors dressed as Shakespeare and he was recounting the whole story in normal English so kids would understand. And the girl who played Juliet was taking directions from Shakespeare and they they did the whole play through the, the dialogue between Shakespeare and Juliet and he was teaching her how to die on stage. So this took away the, 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 the horror of the suicide. So Juliet, when she kind of collapses and dies on stage, the kids giggle because it's almost comical. And this taught them prejudice, you know, about how this young girl and her boyfriend had to die because they were not allowed to be together because they were from different families. So every one of the plays, we try to teach a little bit of pre anti-prejudice. And we had wonderful costumes and two-man shows. And we traveled all over the United States, other than Alaska and Hawaii. We went to every single state. And I remember there was one school we used to go to in West Virginia where there were only 50 children and they were pretty much all related. And this was the big deal, you know, all the, the troop of actors are coming and the kids had to be good all year or they wouldn't get to see the play. And we, we used to go there every year. We used to do those shows for free because they were really poor. And the actors were so thrilled to be going there. It was an amazing place. It was way in the mountains and everybody was poor. There's so much poverty in America too that people don't realize. We all think of America as the two coasts and all the urban areas, but there is terrible poverty in certain areas. The Cohen Center, could you explain what you're doing at Keene State well, College? Well, what happened at Keene State College is that I am now a fellow there. I I participate in teaching teachers how to teach Holocaust. I know it sounds kind of complicated. Basically, uh, we teach the, the, the teachers how to access the available data that we have and how to, how to approach it at, for different age groups. They used to have a conference every summer, two-week conference where we all attended. It was wonderful. And there were teachers from all over the world coming there. And the amount of, of intellectual acumen in that place is, is terrific. All the people there are academics of the, of the highest grade. They have incredible educational backgrounds. A lot of them are theologians. And very few of them are Jewish because, you know, although it's called the Cohen Center, it really concentrates on genocide in general as well as the Holocaust. Last summer, you and Governor Sununu got together and he signed a bill. Governor Sununu heard me speaking somewhere and then I got a call from his secretary saying, would you be willing to go once a month to a different school, different high school in a different district and do your do your presentation together with the governor. And I was very flattered. And I said, of course. And we went, we did a couple of those, and they were very successful. And, you know, for a politician, I was astounded because he stood there and he said to the kids, well, guys, my generation screwed up. And for a politician to admit any kind of fault, I find very important. You know, you don't get many of those they're always making excuses or, or, or just bragging. And he he's also told the children he's afraid for his own children's future because there's so much hatred. And this is one of the reasons why he was so supportive of my story, because he wants to use it against prejudice. When we presented the bill to him to teach genocide and Holocaust studies in all the schools, he signed it in, in, into, into law. And, you know, it was during the COVID thing, and I was the only person at the signing. He and I were the only people at the signing. I was very, very thrilled with, by that. And, you know, he said to me that um, he's very, very proud to sign this. 
And then he called me a New Hampshire treasure. <laughs> You are a New Hampshire treasure. <laughs> so this is what the New Hampshire treasure looks like. Okay. <laughs> so tell us what you're doing with Netflix, you and your son. Well, what my son made a little, um, sort of a little short uh, episode, a little little film about my childhood. Basically, I'm talking about my childhood, and the little girl is hiding in the hay in a, in a barn. And we put it online for my friends, and we were trying sort of to raise money to make it. And he got in contact with, well, Netflix uh, UK got in contact with him, and they want to do four one-hour documentary about my life and the fact that I'm going to be interviewing um, white supremacists, Nazis in the prison system, because it's very important for me to speak to people who hate me, not just people who agree with me. And I want to find people because I've, I think everybody has a little tiny bit of humanity left somewhere because nobody's born evil, you know, life does something to them. And I want to talk to these people and I want to find out what made them hate me so much. And also the fact that I'm old gives me a tremendous security because everybody has a grandmother. So Breaks that, down barriers. Yeah, they, yeah, there's less likely to to lean over the table and strangle a grandmother. <laughs> so I'm not worried. What do you think leads people to white supremacy, to those movements? What kind of people are drawn? Well, the same kind of people that were drawn to to every cult in the world. They're the sheep. And unfortunately, if the sheep are led by the wrong people, we're in trouble. They are basically very weak-willed people who are easily influenced, who don't like to think for themselves. I would like to share the fact that I'm, I'm very optimistic, believe it or not. With all that, I'm, I'm very optimistic because having spoken at schools now for, I would say, seven years, the change that I have seen in young people is amazing. The generation who's in school now are exceptional. Could be because of the internet, they are more open, they're more in tune with each other, and they don't talk about being rich or famous or what they're going to do when they grow up. They talk about the environment, they talk about poverty, they talk about inequality. They don't care if you're gay, straight, black, white. They don't have prejudices like the generations before them. And I think this generation will change the world. They'll save the world. And, you know, there's a Jewish expression, tikkun olam, which means mending the world. And I think that these kids will mend the world because destroying what there is doesn't, doesn't do it. You have to mend it, not destroy it. And these kids are so in tune with that and they're so, they care so deeply I'm so optimistic. I'm, every time I go and speak to young people, I, I come home and I'm high for two days. It's wonderful. And I think our world is going to be okay. How did you and your husband come to move to New Hampshire? We came to New Hampshire because we liked the area and it was near the sea so we could go sailing and it wasn't too far from a, an international airport. And, oh, he liked mountain climbing as well, rock climbing. So we had all those things around. And I also wanted to have at least 50 acres because I thought that if anything happens in the world, I can always grow my food. And so we we found this place, and the, it's the only place I've lived this long. Before that, I I, live, I moved every two years. This is my 28th permanent home. Wow. And we stayed here, and, and Gordon became a selectman. He was pretty much running the town, and uh, he did a lot for it. Again, he, he, he learned. I don't know whether that came from his background or from the kibbutz, but he was always one to give back to 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 the to society, whatever he could. I mean, you know, he would deliver wood to people who didn't have wood 
uh, to burn. Uh, he, he would f- get the wood and take it to their homes at night and in, in winter. He did things like that all the time. I was on the school board for 15 years. And why did you get involved? Well, it was an amazing thing because I... Because somebody wanted to burn a book. It all started from that. A neighbor told me that there's somebody on the school board of our town who doesn't like some of the books and they want to burn them. And when I heard burning books, it it rang big bells with me. So I, I became an American citizen because you can't run for office any other way. And I decided to go on the school board to make sure that there was freedom to read whatever they wanted. And I was I, I was the first person on the school board to advocate for A, a better library, and to advocate for more inclusion. And also, they had no computers then, you know, it was that long ago. So we got computers, we got music, we got art, we got drama. I think I think it it was it was beneficial but it wasn't easy because you you run into a lot of opposition like you know people used to come to school and a kid would come to school with a soda so I banned sodas from the school and I almost got lynched by the town they were saying how can you tell us what our children should be eating or drinking but the kids were much better without the soda they they didn't climb the walls when they came into school in the morning. And now, you know, it's perfectly acceptable, but it's always the first person who proposes something different that is shocking. Well, change is uncomfortable. Yes. If, if you put in the work, people accept you. If you come in and you throw your weight around, of course, it doesn't work. But if you're down there working with people, and we both joined the ambulance as well, and Gordon joined the fire department, the volunteer fire department. So we all knew everybody and we worked with people. And when you have a child, you also meet people through the school. And the school was very important to us because some of the kids here, that's all they have for education. This is it. So it's, it's, it's up to us all to educate the young. Any other thoughts? I just, I just hope that I, I can see this country recover. Because I remember 9-11. It was such a wonderful time. It's a horrible thing to say, but it was a happy time for this country because we realized how we're all in it together. We all pulled together. What happened? We have to get back to that. And my worry is that when Trump loses the election, there'll be quite a bit of bloodshed because some of his some of his acolytes will they have guns and they'll start shooting and there'll be some bloodshed. But if he do, if he wins, I am going to go out with my gun and I do have one <laughs> because as a Jew, you know, I'm very ambiguous about firearms. But if my father had a gun, he wouldn't have died in the dog kennel. He might have died on his feet. He would have died, but he would have died standing. And I intend to stand when I die. I'm not lying down for anybody. It's a horrible thing to say as an 81-year-old woman, but I certainly don't believe in taking it peacefully if, if somebody tries to change our country to make it even worse. And here in New Hampshire, we have it easy. It's not too bad. So people don't feel it. But I find that generally speaking, It's not an anti-Semitic state. I don't feel any, I mean, I never had any problems personally. Everybody knows who I am. In Paris, I was called a dirty Jew um, everywhere else, but not here. You know, I exercise my demons by talking. It took me a long time to be able to talk. You know, my parents' generation couldn't talk. I'm, I'm a second generation. I can talk because... Although it touched me, it didn't, it didn't maim me to the same extent. And I'm able to talk. And the more I talk, the, 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 the less upset I get about everything, the, the more calm I am, the more assured I am that it's, it's okay and this is what I should be doing. This is probably why I'm still alive. This is why I didn't die from cancer, because I need to talk. Thank you for being the voice of people who can't speak. Thank you.
Love you. <laughs> I love you too. Kati's autobiography is titled Holocaust to Healing, Closing the Circle. She's also in the process of publishing a graphic novel titled Hidden, which is geared toward middle school students. Do you have a compelling story, or do you know someone I should interview? Drop me a line at diaryofanation at gmail.com. Please tell a friend to listen, too. That's how we grow our audience and continue podcasting. Find Diary of a Nation through your favorite podcast app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Diary of a Nation. <laughs>